Mark, this is Democracy Now! We're going to continue advocating for what's right in the public schools in the city of Chicago. Um, we are going to like continue asking the, the wealthy and powerful in the city to um, uh, to help support the work of educating working class kids in black, Latinx, uh, and white neighborhoods uh, all across the city. Those are things that we're committed to. School teachers in Chicago are heading back today, marking the end of a historic 11-day strike that shut down the nation's third largest school district. We'll get the latest. Then we speak to a former Gambian beauty queen who's accused the country's former dictator of rape. Fatou Jallo, known as Tufa, just testified before Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. Yeah, yeah, Jambi did not want um, sex with me or pleasure with me. What he wanted to do was to hurt me. What he wanted to do was to teach me a lesson. What he wanted to do was to manifest his ego. And we go to Colombia, where five indigenous leaders have been massacred in the southwestern province of Cauca. Colombian President Ivan Duque has deployed 2,500 troops to the region. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The House of Representatives voted along partisan lines Thursday to formalize the impeachment inquiry into Donald Trump. All 196 House Republicans voted against the measure, and all but two Democrats voted in favor of the resolution, which sets the stage for the first public hearings of the investigation. This is California Democrat Adam Schiff, chair of the House Intelligence Committee. The Founding Fathers understood that a leader might take hold of the Oval Office who would sacrifice the national security, who would fail to defend the Constitution, who would place his personal or political interests above the interests of the country. They understood that might happen. And they provided a mechanism to deal with it, and that mechanism is called impeachment. The House vote came as Tim Morrison, a top official on Trump's National Security Council, testified in a closed-door hearing that the president withheld nearly $400 million in military aid to Ukraine over the summer. Morrison's account corroborated other officials' claims that Trump's move was meant to pressure Ukraine's leader to publicly investigate former Vice President Joe Biden and his son Hunter. President Trump and First Lady Melania Trump have filed a declaration of domicile, declaring their permanent residence to be the Mar-a-Lago Club in Palm Beach, Florida. They were previously listed as residing at Trump Tower in New York City, where Donald Trump has been a lifelong resident. The New York Times cited an official close to Trump who said the move was primarily for tax purposes. Florida residents pay no state income tax. In a tweet, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo wrote, quote, good riddance, it's not like Donald Trump paid taxes here anyway. He's all yours, Florida. In Afghanistan, the CIA is accused of backing Afghan strike forces, whose members have committed summary executions and other atrocities without accountability. In a 53-page report released Thursday, Human Rights Watch says the CIA-backed Afghan soldiers unlawfully killed civilians during night raids, forcibly disappeared detainees and attacked health care workers who allegedly treated Taliban fighters. This is Patricia Grossman, Asia director of Human Rights Watch. So what we're calling on all the parties involved to do is adhere to the, the laws of war, adhere to the rules in place. The problem with these particular militia groups, these paramilitaries, is they operate outside normal chains of command within the ordinary Afghan government forces or the U.S. forces. And so they're not held accountable. And the lack of transparency means civilians cannot go to someone and find out what happened, get any kind of justice for the crimes that were committed. The Intercept reports a loophole in U.S. law allows the CIA to ignore a rule barring the Pentagon and State Department from training or equipping foreign military units when there's credible information they've committed serious human rights abuses. Iraqi Prime Minister Adel Abdel Mahdi on Thursday offered to resign if lawmakers could agree on his replacement, as tens of thousands of anti-government protesters continued to rally in cities across Iraq. Mahdi's resignation offer comes after more than 250 people have died at the hands of Iraqi security forces since the protests began last month. They're demanding jobs, better public services and an end to government corruption. In Argentina, thousands marched to the streets of Buenos Aires 
Friday's Thursday in the capital city's first major demonstration since incumbent President Mauricio Macri lost Sunday's election to center-left candidate Alberto Fernandez. Protesters are demanding a reversal of cuts to pensions and public utility subsidies imposed after last year's $57 billion bailout by the International Monetary Fund. They're also demanding the Senate pass a bill expanding food assistance to combat rampant hunger. This is Esteban Marcioni, who led a protest outside IMF's offices. What we're going through is a catastrophe. The price increases on food makes the situation truly unsustainable. What we're debating every day is whether to eat or not. Chile's government held talks with opposition leaders Thursday in a bid to quell anti-government protests now entering their third week. The protests erupted October 19th, sparked by a hike in subway fares, but quickly grew to nationwide demonstrations against inequality, the high cost of living and privatization. This week's Chile this week, Chile's embattled president, Sebastian Piñera, canceled two major international summits as a result of the protests, the upcoming APEC Economic Summit and the United Nations Climate summit in December. He announced Thursday Spain has offered to host the COP. That's the climate summit. Yesterday, I spoke with the president of Spain, Pedro Sanchez, who made the generous offer to organize the COP25 summit in Madrid, Spain, the same day it was planned to be carried out in Chile, meaning from the 2nd to the 13th of December this year. Spain will have just one month to prepare for the global summit in Madrid, which will follow snap elections on November 10th. Democracy Now! will be covering the U.N. climate summit. Here in New York City, former Secretary of State Rex Tillerson told a federal court Wednesday ExxonMobil did not mislead shareholders about the financial risks of climate change while Tillerson was CEO of the company. Investors suing the oil giant contend under Tillerson's leadership in 2014, Exxon kept two sets of books on the predicted costs of future climate regulations, lowballing internal company estimates in order to justify carbon intensive projects like mining Canada's tar sands. A damning report by Inside Climate News and Los Angeles Times revealed Exxon knew fossil fuels contributed to climate change as early as the 70s, but did not take any action, even as it covered up the science. The student group Fridays for Future NYC is leading a school strike and rally today outside the Manhattan courthouse, where the Exxon trial is underway. The group tweeted, Exxon knew in 1982 they were stealing our future, and now they'll pay for it, unquote. Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg has turned down the Nordic Council Environment Prize, rejecting $52,000 in award money. In a statement posted to Instagram, Thunberg called the offer a huge honor, but wrote, quote, "...the climate movement does not need any more awards. What we need is for our politicians and the people in power start to listen to the current best available science." She'll be speaking today at Los Angeles City Hall. In California, homes in San Bernardino burned to the ground Thursday as climate change fueled fires continue to erupt around California. A new fire also broke out in Ventura County, prompting thousands more to evacuate. In North Dakota, the Keystone Pipeline remains idled after the TC Energy Company, that's formerly TransCanada, said a rupture spilled over 380,000 gallons of crude oil in a rural wetland. The spill came as the Environmental Protection Agency moved to roll back Obama-era regulations meant to prevent toxic heavy metals from coal ash from leaching into groundwater. California Democratic Congressmember Katie Hill delivered her final remarks on the floor of the House of Representatives Thursday in a scathing critique of the double standard, she said, that apply to men and women in Washington. Hill was elected to represent Southern California's 25th District last November as one of the first openly bisexual people elected to Congress. She announced her resignation this week after admitting to a consensual relationship with a campaign aide before she took office. House ethics investigators are also looking into an alleged affair between Hill and her legislative director, though Hill has denied that relationship. The allegations surfaced after redstate.org and the Daily Mail published naked images of Hill without her consent. 
Hill has accused her abusive husband of enlisting the help of hateful political operatives, she said, in a smear campaign based on cyber exploitation. I'm leaving because of a misogynistic culture that gleefully consumed my naked pictures, capitalized on my sexuality, and enabled my abusive ex to continue that abuse, this time with the entire country watching. I'm leaving, but we have men who have been credibly accused of intentional acts of sexual violence and remain in boardrooms, on the Supreme Court, in this very body, and worst of all, in the Oval Office. New York Congressmember Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez told Politico, quote, this doesn't happen to male members in the same way, revenge porn in this respect. I don't think we're really talking about how targeted and serious this is. We're talking about a major crime, Ocasio-Cortez said. In Missouri, a series of public hearings is underway to determine the fate of the state's last remaining abortion provider, a Planned Parenthood clinic in St. Louis. In June, state officials moved to deny the clinic clinic's license to perform abortions in a move decried by pro-choice groups as a politically motivated attack on reproductive rights. On Tuesday, Missouri Health Director Dr. Randall Williams admitted he kept a spreadsheet tracking the menstrual periods of Planned Parenthood patients, a database that was emailed between health department employees. Missouri lawmakers are demanding the governor investigate the spreadsheet as a major violation of medical privacy laws. On Thursday, the director of surgical services at Planned Parenthood St. Louis Clinic broke down in tears as she testified about invasive, medically unnecessary pelvic exams she was forced to administer to people seeking abortions under a state mandate that has since been reversed. In August, a federal judge blocked Missouri's near-total ban on abortions one day before it was set to take effect. A federal court halted a similar abortion ban in Alabama earlier this week, citing the Supreme Court's landmark 1973 three decision, Roe v. Wade. In Gambia, a beauty queen who says the president raped her when she was 18 years old testified Thursday to a public Truth and Reconciliation Commission that's investigating the atrocities of former president Yaya Jame. Fatu Tufa Jalo has become a leading voice against the former president, who ruled the West African country of two million people for 22 years before his regime ended in 2017. Two other women have also come forward to accuse the former president of rape and sexual assault. Later in the broadcast will go to Gambia to speak with Tufa Jalo about her testimony. In Hong Kong, police fired tear gas Thursday evening to clear crowds of anti-authoritarian protesters who mingled with Halloween revelers in the city's busiest nightlife district. The protesters used the holiday as an excuse to once again defy a government ban on face masks imposed last month as part of a widening crackdown on public assemblies. I think if everyone here wears a mask, everyone can represent us. Hong Kong has a mask ban now, but our people will not yield to this ridiculous law. Economic data released Thursday show Hong Kong entered a recession in recent months amidst a violent response to protests that erupted in June. Another massive protest is being planned for Saturday. And Jordan has recalled its ambassador in Tel Aviv after Israel refused to release two Jordanian citizens who've been held without charge since their arrests in the Israeli-occupied West Bank in August. Israel routinely uses its administrative detention policy to hold Palestinians indefinitely without trial in military jails. On Thursday, Palestinian protesters in the West Bank city of Ramallah held a solidarity rally. This is demonstrator Raya Zayada. These protests and rallies are in solidarity with our female and male prisoners in the occupation jails, especially the prisoners who are on hunger strike, and especially the prisoner Hiba Labadi, whose life is in danger. We are all here in one voice that says we are with the prisoners, both men and women. Jordanian Palestinian Hiba Al Abadi has been held in an Israeli jail without charge since August when she was arrested after crossing between Jordan and the occupied West Bank. She's been on hunger strike for nearly 40 days, was hospitalized after her health deteriorated. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. 
Teachers in Chicago are heading back to school today, marking the end of a historic 11-day strike that had shut down the nation's third-largest school district. After weeks of tense negotiation, the city agreed to reduce class sizes, bring on hundreds of extra social workers, nurses and librarians, and increase salary by 16 percent over the next five years, with big gains for low-wage workers. This is Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot announcing the news. I'm happy to announce that we have reached an agreement uh, with uh, CTU President Jesse Sharkey. Classes will resume tomorrow. We invited him to come out so we could do a joint announcement. He declined, but we have an agreement, and teachers will be back in class, and students will be back in class tomorrow. The union demanded teachers be able to make up the full 11 days of school before agreeing to return to work. They eventually settled with the city on five days. Negotiations lasted hours. Union members were split on whether or not to approve the deal with the city. This is Chicago Teachers Union President Jesse Sharkey. This has been a tense last two weeks, and um, but it's not about me or the mayor. This is about the members of the Chicago Teachers Union. It's about, about 20,000 teachers um, and thousands of education support workers and clinicians. And um, frankly, our members are still out there on the picket line today. And um, they don't need to see me smiling with the mayor when, in, in fact, what they, they need to see is they need to see that we have a tentative agreement. We now have a return to work agreement. I'm, I'm glad that people get to return to work. We've been wanting, you know, uh, frankly, it's been hard on teachers um, to be out this long. And uh, it's been hard on parents to be out this long. It's been hard on our students. And um, so, I, you know, I, I just didn't feel like doing a, um, a celebration lap with, with the mayor right now. 7,500 public school workers with the Service Employees International Union, who had been striking, also settled with the city earlier this week. They stayed on the picket lines through Thursday. Well, for more, we're joined by two guests in Chicago. Stacey Davis-Gates is with us, executive vice president of the Chicago Teachers Union. And labor journalist Sarah Jaffe joins us from Philadelphia, author of Necessary Trouble, Americans in Revolt. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Let's go directly to Chicago. Stacey Davis-Gates, can you talk Talk about what this deal is that you struck, the Chicago Teachers Union, with the city of Chicago, that if the, um, all the workers approve, um, ends well today, uh, teachers are back at school. Good morning. Um, our members took a 10-day sacrifice to finally bring about some equity in the Chicago public schools. Um, our school communities will have a nurse five days a week in every school, a social worker five days a week in every school. Um, school communities on the south and the west side of the city are now being prioritized. They will get the wraparound supports that they need. The class size limits will go into effect almost—it um, will go into effect faster for them. Um, look, th this sacrifice that our members made has ushered in a new type of Chicago public schools that offer sanctuary to their students, that provides homeless students with the necessary supports. We are very pleased with the outcomes, and um, we just really thank our parents in the city for standing by us. So, talk also about the salary and health care benefits that you negotiated. Um, virtually no change in our health insurance, um, and our members um, got a 16 percent COLA increase, cost of living increase. Um, our PSRPs, our lowest wage workers in this, um, in our bargaining unit, two thirds of them were um, their children could qualify for free and reduced lunch prior to going on strike. Now we've lifted that basement, and those women um, who serve in our school communities, who are the glue in our school communities, they don't have to exist in poverty anymore. The Chicago Tribune ran an editorial headlined, This CTU Strike Has Betrayed Chicago's Children. The editorial read in part, quote, There are about 300,000 children in Chicago who have missed nearly two weeks of classroom instruction and after-school activities. There are high schoolers who have fallen behind on college application preparations, athletes who lost the chance to participate in postseason playoffs and tournaments, and there are children from every community who counted on school as a sanctuary. For thousands of those children, Children. School essentially was their only place of learning, emotional support and consistency. The editorial went on to criticize CTU leaders, saying, quote, they made outlandish demands as if City Hall owed teachers not just a big wage bump, but a utopian version of Chicago. Um, 
Stacey Davis Gates, can you respond? Well, we got what we needed for our students. Um, it's always outlandish and utopian um, when right-wing news sources limit the resources that black children, brown children in this city get to have. Um, it is a shame that the Tribune cannot see um, the work that teachers did um, in these 10 days as a benefit for the entire city. Um, I know that our members are happy to go back to work today. Um, they're happy to go back to work because they are a part of ushering in a new way of doing public education in the city that prioritizes the least of them, a bargaining structure that is for the common good, because our members serve the common good. Um, and we're very pleased about the transformation that our city is going through in this moment that is led by a movement, a movement of community groups, of parents, of students that um, amplified in this moment with their teachers. And can you talk about the fact that it was not only the Chicago Teachers Union, but SEIU, the Service Employees International Union, that also went on strike? The significance of this? The significance of that is that these are black women who are making um, wages. Um, that did not make sense in a city um, that uh, in a city that's growing increasingly unaffordable. These women went out on the picket line with the teachers, and they won tremendous gains in their salary structure. I, you know, I'll be honest with you. I don't think that this could have been as transformative as. Um, as monumental as it was without SEIU 73 members on the picket line with us. Those women said that their contract um, before we settled ours, and the very next day, they were on the picket lines with us. Um, the solidarity that we had with the city, with each other, was tremendous uh, in this moment. Look, this is a movement that has been percolating for the last decade in this city to bring about change that focuses on those communities that have been left behind while skyscrapers in downtown Chicago are built with taxpayer money. This is a shift in how we conceive of public resources actually helping those who need them the most. Um, this is a win for our city. This is a win for our state. This is a win for our country. Um, Stacey Davis Gates, you're a mom of three school kids in the Chicago schools. Um, I think about that editorial that talked about this utopian version of Chicago you're looking for. Can you talk about what educational justice means? It means that black children in Chicago don't have to beg for a nurse, which is the bare minimum for most children across this country. Listen, Chicago has a very um, terrible history of racism and segregation. And when you read editorials like that, it provokes those same feelings again. Look, our children, every single child in the Chicago public schools deserves more than what we even want in this contract. This contract sets forth an infrastructure to help us fight for even more. Listen, when you can take a public subsidy and build a playground in one of the richest neighborhoods in this country and, and call it a giveaway, but then make teachers pick it and strike for 10 days to get a social worker in school communities that have been ravaged by violence, poverty, unemployment, and disinvestment. There is something wrong with the priorities and values of those who are in charge. What I am saying today is that I am proud that Chicago lifted its voice in unison to say that we're going to transform the way in which we um, prioritize children in this city, our school communities in this city, and the public sector in this city. Sarah Jaffe, you've been looking at school strikes for years, and you've also had this wave of school strikes across the country, not to mention the Chicago Teachers Union strike of 2012. Talk about the significance of what just took place with the uh, nation's third largest school district. I think we have to start with the Chicago strike of 2012, because that is where this entire wave was rooted. When Stacey says that they've been fighting for a decade, this is— a caucus within this union that took power in 2010 that fought for the right to strike and then successfully went on strike in 2012, beat Rahm Emanuel, who was in many ways more committed to privatizing, to crushing the public schools, to crushing the union, than Lori Lightfoot was. And so 
That's where this movement began to reform the teachers' unions. The last time I was on talking to you, we were talking about Los Angeles, and the Los Angeles teachers pushed forward this bargaining for the common good framework, and now the CTU has done that again. They've come back to the center of the teachers' union movement, where they belonged, because they've always been there. They brought demands around housing. And they won demands around housing. They won extra funding for students that are suffering from homelessness. They won extra social workers, nurses, the things that these students actually need to be able to go to schools and learn. You know, Stacey Davis Gates, you had uh, talked about uh, Mayor Lightfoot being a shero, that she had the opportunity to be a shero. How would you assess what she's done over these last 10 days? Well, I would say we're disappointed that it took a strike for her to make good on the promises that she put forth on the campaign trail. Um, I think that this serves as notice to all of us in the movement that when candidates uh, assume our positions and our platforms and our agendas, that we can hold them accountable to making good on those things. Look, um, this was never about a power struggle. In fact, for the last decade, it has been about giving Chicago students what they deserve. Um, and she was in a position to do it before the strike, and certainly our members took it to a strike, and they won those things for their students. Sarah Jaffe, um, there is a lot of union activism going on right now, not only teachers across the country, but you have the GM strike ended on Friday. We're talking about nearly 50,000 workers and um, the most significant strike against GM in like half a century. And you have on mm -hmm. Wednesday UAW reaching a deal with Ford. Um, talk about this. Where to begin? Um, it's It was surprising to almost everybody, including some of the workers at GM, that the union was willing to go to a strike in the first place. They were out on strike for, I believe, um, you know, over four weeks, for 60 days, um, so 40 days, I'm sorry. And when you look at what's going on in the country, again, I, I always start with Chicago re sort of reviving the strike. But at GM, you also saw the difference between what it looks like to have a union like the CTU that is prepared for this, that knows what they're going for, that has a democratic bargaining structure, a big bargaining team that is transparent and communicates with its members, versus a lot of the GM workers that I talked to were feeling kind of uncomfortable, not sure what was going on, didn't really feel that the union leadership was communicating with them and are disappointed in the contract, and the contract nearly didn't pass. I talked to a lot of workers who were voting no on it. So the question of whether you can take the kind of bargaining for a common good framework that the CTU and other teachers unions have been using and apply that to the private sector, apply that to places like GM, where, you know, the UAW did build the middle class in this country. The UAW's bargaining has always also been for the common good. But it's a little harder to take those issues of homelessness in the community, for instance, to the bargaining table when you are workers at an auto company, an auto company that is facing major changes in its business model. One of the fights at GM this time around was about the um, the closure of certain plants. They're talking about opening a battery plant for electric car production in the area around where the Lordstown plant was in Lordstown, Ohio. But those are not going to be covered jobs that are not going to be covered by the same contract. They're going to be outside. GM wants those to be lower wage, lower security jobs, because that's actually the future of where the company is going. So the GM strike was a mixed bag. Still, the big thing about it is that the workers were ready to stay out. And, you know, for 43 percent of the GM workers were ready to continue the strike, to fight for more. Mm. The New York Times reported last year the number of workers who participated in significant strikes soared to nearly 500,000, its highest point since the mid-'80s, while the duration of yeah. such strikes reached a 15-year high. Elaborate on that, Sarah. Mm. And where does, what does this well, make the future yeah. look like? We're still nowhere near where we were before Ronald Reagan crushed the air traffic controllers union. And we should remember that, because that was a signal from the White House, from the highest position in the land, that it was open season on unions. It's been now open season on unions since pretty much my entire life. I was born in 1980. So 
What we're looking at now is unions that are fighting back in the face of decades and decades of concessions, decades and decades of givebacks. In the public sector, we're talking about fighting back after the Janus decision that made the entire public sector what we call right to work, which means that they do not have to pay anything to the union to be covered by its contract. Despite that, unions like the CTU have not hemorrhaged members. They have actually gained in strength. And as we've seen, they've been able to pull off really impressive strikes and win more for their members. So it's the labor movement certainly not dead it's also not back at peak strength anything close to it but we're also seeing you know our industry is unionizing there uh, the workers here at WHYY in Philadelphia won their union vote two nights ago 70 to 1 it's not nearly as many people as in a UAW plant, but it is a sign that even sort of white-collar workers are understanding that unionizing is a way that they have power on the job and that they can fight back against all sorts of things going on in this industry. And finally, Sarah Jaffe, you just got back from London, where Labor Party organizing um, uh, yeah. is uh, at a peak right now. You have Jeremy mm -hmm. Corbyn, the Labor Party leader, announcing he is challenging Boris Johnson uh, for the prime ministership. Uh, the significance of this? Yeah. The significance of this is actually related, because the Labor Party, somewhat like the Chicago Teachers Union and others of these unions that have reformed, decided when it um, when this leadership got into power to invest in an organizing department. So this is something that CTU did. This is something that the United Teachers Los Angeles did. And now this is something that a major political party, the biggest social democratic party in Europe, has put money into. So I wrote a big feature this summer about the Labor Party's community organizing unit, which is doing this work on the ground around the country in marginal districts, but also just in places where landlords are abusing their tenants, where the, in Newcastle, the owner of the football team, which is, you know, beloved by the entire community, is also one of the country's biggest low-wage employers. And so they are taking these issues that people face every single day and saying, the Labor Party cares about these, and we're going to organize with you around these now. And then when election time comes, they're hoping that that pays off in those people feeling a connection to the Labor Party that maybe they haven't felt in their entire lifetime. I want to thank you both for being with us. Of course, we'll continue to follow these struggles in this country and around the world. Labor journalist Sarah Jaffe, speaking to us from Philadelphia, and Stacey Davis-Gates, executive vice president of the Chicago Teachers Union. When we come back, we speak to a former Gambian beauty queen who's accused the country's former dictator of rape. Fatu Jallo, known as Tufa, just testified yesterday before Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission. And then we'll look at the murder of five indigenous activists in Cauca, Colombia, among them the woman known as the Cauca indigenous governor, Cristina Bautista. Stay with us. We can be out here pleasing everybody. Patio glass, the mazel top cocktails, bomb for bombastic. Used to drop acid, Marley comes soon. I only drop plastics. Everyone asks when that heat gon' drop, when that knee gon' drop, when is he gon' pop? The question we all got, cause this could be all block. You're living in a glass house, we can see all clocks, but I can see you from the other side, see all rocks. And we could have been Magneto if you see our locks, but we share with the world. That's all day long by Chance the Rapper featuring John Legend. Chance was on Saturday Night Live last week, and he was wearing a bright red um, sweatshirt that said uh, at CTU, Chicago. Teachers Union. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn to Gambia, where a Gambian beauty queen who says the former president, Yaya Jame, raped her when she was 18 years old, has testified before Gambia's Public Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Fatu Jallo, known as Tufa, has become a leading voice against the former president, who ruled the West African country of two million people for 22 years before his regime ended in 2017. This is Tufa speaking before the commission Thursday, a warning. She describes the attack in graphic detail. Yaya Jame decided to um, 
um, penetrate me. But before he did, he took out um, um, a needle from his pocket and um, he injected me on my arm. I'm not sure of what it is or what it was for. Yaya Jambe did not want um, sex with me or pleasure with me. What he wanted to do was to hurt me. What he wanted to do was to teach me a lesson. What he wanted to do was to manifest his ego. Just like many of us can't believe that a girl can say no, um, someone like Yajambe and in his position found it very disrespectful for um, a 19 year old from not an elite background or not the daughter of a president to somehow gather some kind of audacity to say no to him. Um, that he is a man probably who hasn't had so many no's. And my no wasn't because of um, 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 a sense of um, understanding or I was better off, I wanted to. My no was just because I felt it was wrong. That's Tufa Jallo testifying Thursday before Gambia's Truth, Reconciliation, Reparations Commission. Two other women have also come forward to accuse the former president of rape and sexual assault. Human Rights Watch says that Yahya Jame, quote, handpicked women and girls to rape or sexually assault while president, requiring so-called protocol girls to be on call for sex. Jame denies the claims. Gambia's Truth and Reconciliation hearings have been live-streamed across Gambia in an ongoing reckoning of the horrors committed uh, during Jame's rule, including killing and disappearing hundreds of people, torture and justified jailings and sexual violence against women and girls. Members of Jame's death squad have admitted during the hearings to killing migrants, journalists and civilians during the president's reign. The perpetrators of this violence have never been brought to justice, including Jame himself, who fled to Equatorial Guinea in 2017 after losing the 2016 presidential election. At first, he refused to cede power for weeks before the leaders in the region helped arrange his exile. Well, we go via Democracy Now! video stream to Gambia, where we're joined by Tufa Jallo, along with attorney Reed Brody of Human Rights Watch, who's currently leading the prosecution of the former Gambian dictator, Yahya Jame. We welcome you both back to Democracy Now! Tufa, can you describe how you felt yesterday, as you testified not only before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Gambia, but you were live-streamed throughout Gambia and the world. You did this for hours yesterday, in graphic detail. Talk about how you feel today, what this meant to you, why you chose to return to Gambia to make this statement. Um, thank you for having me. I feel great. I actually felt like the message has been sent. It was a very difficult day, as you said, hours and hours of um, testifying. But I thought it was necessary and it was important that it was translated in our local languages and um, that we do not hide behind euphemisms anymore. So it's it's actually fulfilling and I just hope that it contributes to what brings Yaya Jame and, and his um, allies to, to justice. Now, you made a decision to publicly testify. Others who've gone through terrible um, abuse uh, were protected witnesses. Why did you decide to be so public? Um, it's something that I have thought about, and I completely understand why women decide to be protected or decide not to come out publicly. We have all seen the backlash and all the implications that come with it. But again, if there is no face to what is being said, it will not be taken seriously. People will think of them as just stories and not see the human beings behind these stories. Um, so I decided that I would not hide behind a fear anymore. And uh, in order to take back that power, I have to be able to face him, no matter how difficult that might be. And what kind of response have you gotten from your fellow and sister Gambians? 
It's been great so far. Of course, there are supporters of the president that are still reluctant on uh, calling me a liar and attacking. But overall, um, women, especially Gambian feminists, women empowerment groups, um, um, women that are serving in the National Assembly, they've really come forward to embrace this moment. Um, a lot of women have come forward. We've watched the TRC and we've seen women come in there and testifying about abuses that have been committed against their bodies. So it's been a very welcoming Me Too movement for the Gambia. Um, and, and, and yeah, the conversation is really ongoing online and also in our communities. Mm. So can you briefly describe how you are able to testify today the fact that you fled Gambia after you were raped, as you describe it, by the president, the dictator of Gambia. You had been crowned a beauty queen in Gambia. Um, and then describe what happened. I mean, it's it's been a long journey. It is a beauty pageant, but also more of a scholarship pageant um, to be sponsored to go and study abroad. That was the main focus of the pageantry. And it's something that I took pride in. And up to date, I do not regret uh, experiences or the process. I was in it with so many other brilliant young women. It just so happened that the president saw it as an avenue to have access to girls, younger girls, um, and without questions being asked. So I still wear that um, crown boldly and proudly as a Gambian beauty queen. Um, the beauty, though, about it is that I have owned my truth and the truth of other women and gone through so much healing and so, so much pain and it took me a long time to get here, but my mother and my father has been very supportive, and that helps within the context of the culture that I come from. And so after you were crown beauty queen and he summoned you to the palace, um, uh, Jame, um, and you describe graphically what happened to you, as you describe that he raped you, then talk about how you fled the country and why you felt you needed to. I mean, this is, uh, what, in 2015, and how old were you? Um, I was 19 years old in 2015, um, when the rape happened, because it happened once. I received a call again to answer to him. Um, within a dictatorship, I have already, at this point, seen the consequences of saying no. Um, I could not hide. I couldn't say no. I would have been taken whether I wanted to or not. So I had two options. It's either to keep uh, being used as a sex object or I run away from everything that I love and know and start a new life. Um, at that age, I didn't know where I was going to or what awaited me on the other side of the, of the table. But I, I took that chance that I would rather be in the wilderness um, than be abused or raped time and time again. And so you escape the country? How did you escape? I escaped through um, a taxi. I pretend I went to the market to do groceries, um, just to throw whoever off was following me. And then I went to Banjul, which is the capital, and I did not take the ferry. I took a boat because it is unlikely to be found on one. And then um, I took another car that was transporting livestock, and I sat between two men in the front. And I was wearing a niqab to hide my face and my identity. And uh, I found myself on the other side of the border, which is Senegal. And now you are residing in Canada, but have returned to Gambia. Um, an image that is so graphic is people all over the country standing up and saying with signs, I am Tufa, your name, your nickname. Um, Reed Brody, we only have a few minutes. You are leading um, the push for the prosecution of Jame. Um, you're an attorney with Human Rights Watch. Can you talk about the significance of Tufa's testimony and where that prosecution prosecution stands today, did the president respond as he is in exile in Equatorial Guinea? Sure. I mean, Tufa's testimony yesterday was the culmination of several weeks of hearings at the Truth Commission about sexual violence. And you had women coming forward to talk about being raped 
by uh, Jammeh's interior minister, by Jammeh's secret service. You had a protected witness talking about uh, this system, uh, how she was hired to be a protocol girl. She was offered jobs and scholarships. And when she refused to have sex with him, she was fired. You had a cohort, Jammeh's head of protocol, who described the same system. So there was an entire system in place. Now, the Truth Commission, as you mentioned earlier, is just spewing out information about torture, assassinations, now rape, um, committed by the former president who lives in exile in Equatorial Guinea. The hope is that when the Truth Commission finishes its work, um, it will recommend the prosecution of Jame as well as other people who, who bear the greatest responsibility for the crimes of that period, um, and that we will move from the truth process, which is very important, to the to the justice process, which for, for most victims uh, is even more important, in which uh, Jame's henchmen and hopefully Yaya Jame himself, the government will seek his extradition. Um, since Jame has victimized not only Gambians, but um, there was a massacre of migrants from Ghana and Nigeria and Senegal and Togo and, and Cote d'Ivoire, that there will be a regional consensus in favor of bringing Yaya Jame to justice. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us. Uh, Tufa Jallo, Gambian anti-rape activist, returning to Gambia to boldly confront her rapist on national television, and Reed Brody, Human Rights Watch uh, uh, attorney. Uh, we want to thank you both for being with us, and your bravery, Tufa, is— um, is just overwhelming, uh, uh, I think, for so many people and inspiring. When we come back, Colombia is reeling after five indigenous leaders were massacred in Cauca earlier this week, among them the uh, woman known as the indigenous governor of Cauca, uh, Cristina Bautista. Now the president of Colombia has deployed over 2,000 troops to the region. Stay with us. Recoge solo tus ideas, levanta para acá tu mirada para todo lo que venga. Me está llamando. El día que amanece lento, recoge solo tus ideas, levanta para acá tu mirada para todo lo que venga. Me está llamando. Semilla que va germinando, paciencia que el enfoque llega, el tiempo que flota en el aire, las horas al viento se entrega. Semilla que va germinando, paciencia que el enfoque llega, el tiempo que flota en el aire y el viento se entrega. Me está llamando. De a poco te zapas del miedo, un dedo tras otro lo sueltan, en tu pecho una llamarada que por dentro quema. Me está llamando. De a poco te zapas del miedo. Un dedo tras otro lo suelta, en tu pecho una llamada que todo lo quema. Me te está llamando. llamando. Y me está llamando. Flame and Calling by the Colombian American Van Maku Sound System, performing in Democracy Now! studios. To see the interview as well as performances of Maku, go to democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show in Colombia, where the massacre of five indigenous leaders in the southwestern region of Cauca Tuesday has sent shockwaves through Colombia. The massacre unfolded when a group of men in a black vehicle reportedly opened fire on a convoy of indigenous guards in Tequeo, according to the Association of Indigenous Councils of Northern Cauca. The men also fired an ambulance tending to those who were injured in the attack. Among the victims was Cristina Bautista, the chief of the semi-autonomous indigenous reservation of Nasa Tokeo. Four of the community's unarmed guards were also killed, while six others were wounded. On Monday night, just hours before being murdered, Cristina Bautista sent an alarming audio recording to some of her WhatsApp contacts. We are in the checkpoint at the headquarters, and a black van just drove by. The men started shooting. Thank God no one was wounded, but we are on high alert because there is activity here at the shelter. Colombian President Ivan Duque vowed Wednesday to deploy 2,500 troops to the region. He blamed dissidents of the FARC guerrilla rebel group who opposed the country's peace accords, but police have made no arrests and no suspects have been named in the massacre. Since the signing of the peace accords in 2016, at least 700 social leaders have been murdered in Colombia, according to the Institute for Development and Peace Studies, with Afro-Colombian and indigenous activists at the forefront of the targeting. Well, for more, we're 
joined by Mario Murillo, vice dean of the School of Communications at Hofstra University, award-winning journalist who's extensively reported on Colombia and the region of Cauca. Mario, welcome back to Democracy Now! I went to see you lead a discussion yesterday at New York University. Uh, the mourning of people, not only in Colombia, but, I mean, Cristina Bautista was just recently here in the United States, a leader in the indigenous community and resistance. Can you talk about what you understand took place? It's good to know, and I, and I appreciate you doing this. Um, this is shocking, um, talking to the community. In fact, all day yesterday, being in touch with folks on the ground in Tacuello and other parts of Cauca, there's shock, there's fear, uh, there's a sense of immobilization, and that's very—that's exactly the, the strategy, is to do precisely that against the indigenous movement. It's shocking, but it's not new. And as you pointed out, over 700 people killed indigenous and other uh, social movement leaders killed. In, in, in Cauca, uh, the, the numbers are about 200. Over 200 indigenous uh, leaders targeted, um, um, uh, threatened. Uh, the, the Ombudsman Office, the Colombian government itself, says from 2016 to 2019, over 1,300 cases of threats, of, of cases of torture. And I think 40 in the past year, indigenous leaders themselves in Cauca killed uh, directly. And we've been he seeing it one by one. But now, suddenly, we see this massacre the other day, and now people are paying attention to it. But it's been going on consistently pretty much over the last three years. And really, for the last 10 years, it's been going on as the coca uh, cultivation continues to escalate in that area, and Cauca being such a strategic location for the coca groups, the, uh, the traffickers who are trying to ship it out and get it out, out of the country. And as you understand and try to reconstruct, as you communicate with people from that region, what took place? Well, what's happening there is really um, a battle of territory, and it's really, once again, the indigenous communities who, for years, for decades, have been struggling to control uh, their sacred territory and do it through peaceful means, through the autonomy, the, the indigenous autonomy and authority that they have. Cristina Bautista is representative of that authority confronting armed groups, confronting all armed groups, from the armed forces themselves, the state security forces, but paramilitary groups, guerrilla groups, uh, and, and narco-trafficking uh, uh, militias, small groups that are working in different ways. We were talking last night with the former president of the Creek, the Indigenous Regional Council of Cauca, who's here in New York, Jesus Avirama, and he pointed out that the big difference now than, than what was going on 30, 20 years ago is that in the past there was a clear definition as to who was who. The community knew that these were far, there might have been FARC combatants there or ELN combatants, paramilitary groups that are operating and working with narco traffickers, and then obviously the government forces themselves. Now what you have is you have a whole dispersed group of uh, of fighters and armed combatants. The government immediately embraced this narrative that this was FARC uh, dissidents. And, and there's a good chance that there were indeed, but there's like a six or seven different groups that identify as FARC dissident groups that basically did not take part in the negotiation that led to the signing of the peace accord in 2016. But these groups have long ties with uh, uh, state security forces. The fact that they're there without any uh, interference, and we're talking about very small thoroughfares where, where there's only one way in or out, and that they weren't stopped indicates— And these are military checkpoints they have yeah. to go through. There so, are a number of bases in Cauca. Right. And this is precisely the argument that the indigenous leaders are making. And when the uh, armed forces announced that they were going to send troops there and they were going to militarize that with cooperation of the indigenous leadership, the indigenous movement immediately pointed out, no, 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 wait a minute. We're not, we're not asking for any military uh, intervention because they're, they're, in many ways, the ones who are killing us. And there are plenty of reports. Even two days before this particular massacre, there was a report of an indigenous leader in Corinto uh, that was uh, of an indigenous organizer activist who was killed and tortured uh, by by military forces. And then the military itself made the argument that this was a, a, a combatant who died in combat. And all the evidence shows that this was just another common, <clears throat> common person there. Um, I want to go to uh, an indigenous activist who was in close touch um, with Christina. Um, Democracy Now! reached her Thursday night, last night, Vilma Almedra. She's also a Nasamisak woman, indigenous leader, friend and colleague of Cristina Bautista. Um, Vilma was in Quito, Ecuador, when we reached her. And she describes the last time she heard from Cristina earlier this week. 
a Cristina la conocí hace por lo menos dos años. Eh, nos identificamos muchísimo porque... I met Cristina almost two years ago. I identified with her a lot because she was a humble woman. She was a very committed woman, but she also addressed the contradictions. We talked about the different contradictions that were seen in our movement and the need to open spaces for dialogue and get on the right path again, as she would say. We had a fluid communication via WhatsApp. Just this Monday, she added me to a WhatsApp group with approximately 70 people from the north of Cauca, but mainly from the town of Toribio. De WhatsApp donde hay aproximadamente unas 70 personas de, del norte del Cauca, pero particularmente de Toribio. Ahí se circula toda la información. En that WhatsApp group we circulate the information of what happens in the Cauca territory. And that Monday at 10:30 at night, Cristina sent a message saying, "Alert! We are at the light post and a van with men shooting drove by." I saw that nobody in the WhatsApp group reacted. Nobody asked. Then I sent a message to Cristina and asked what was happening happening and that if she could record an audio to circulate it and at least make an alert. She sent me that audio. I received it at about 10.30 at night and at 11 I circulated it. And she said that she was very worried, that she felt very alone and that it wasn't her turn to patrol that region that day, but that she, as the authority and caretaker of the territory, it was her responsibility to be there. We then talked at like 12 at night the next day. As I am here in Ecuador, I am not in Colombia. We had commitments and we left, and I did not talk to her that morning. And in the afternoon, I heard the terrible news of the massacre. And right now, we just heard a report that another massacre has occurred in Corinto. And Vilma Almendra then went on to share her message with an American audience, which for decades has funded the so-called war on drugs in Colombia and currently backs the government of the right-wing president, Ivan Duque. As a woman, Nasa Misak, I would ask the people, the processes and the movements to understand that what is happening in Colombia, the war they are inflicting upon us, is precisely to guarantee the reproduction of the patriarchal, colonial and capitalist system to accumulate wealth there in the United States. Who is profiting with this blood, with death, with displacement, with the destruction of our autonomy? Economy here. Understand that we are being subjected to war to guarantee the preservation of a system that not only exists in Colombia, but in different parts of the world, and that the challenge we have as peoples and movements is to try to see beyond the state that inflicts war. We need to self-organize, defend ourselves autonomously, and have autonomous resistance beyond the institution, which is the one that is killing us. That's again Vilma Amendra, a Nasa Misak woman, indigenous leader from Cauca, remembering her friend. Uh, special thanks to Democracy Now's Maria Teresena. Uh, Mario Murillo, uh, you're a Colombian American journalist, have worked so hard on the issue of Colombia for decades. Um, there is the enormous repression and there's the resistance. What is being resisted? I think that's really the threat that the indigenous movement represents to the powers that be and the armed groups. Uh, the, the authority that they pose and that they present in terms of protecting the territory, in terms of defending the land, uh, you know, we're talking a green movement there, the, in, in Colombia, the original green movement, um, they're t using their constitutional authority to protect the land and confronting actors who are, who are taking advantage um, from extractive industries throughout the country mining, illegal mining in Cauca and other parts of the country, uh, to the armed groups that are involved in narco-trafficking, all of those are part of the extractive philosophy that the Colombian government, unfortunately, notwithstanding its discourse against drug trafficking, is, is, is embracing. Um, the, 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 the government of Duque, when he talks about coming and sending in troops to, to, to Cauca, that's precisely what they're wanting to do, militarize the zone and negate the, the authority and the, uh, and the right for the indigenous communities to resist those, those forces. And I think that's really complicated to understand. People ask, why don't they want the military there? 
the military are part of the problem. And unfortunately, the U.S. policy for decades has been driven by military and anti-narcotics, so-called drug, anti-drug war uh, policies that do not take into consideration the rights of the people in terms of their, in terms of their movement and, the, and their rights to resist that, that policy. Well, Mario, of course, we'll continue to follow this. Mario Mario, award-winning journalist and author extensively, has covered Colombia and specifically Cauca. Among his books, Colombia and the United States, War, Unrest and Destabilization. And as we wrap up today's show, uh, welcome to the world, Zyalus Needham, and congratulations to parents, Nat and Amanda. And that does it for Democracy Now! Democracy Now! is currently accepting applications for paid six-month internships here in our New York studio. Learn more and apply at democracynow.org. Democracy Now! is produced by Mike Burke, Dina Gozder, Nermeen Sheikh, Carla Wills, Libby Rainey, Sam Alkoff, John Hamilton, Rabbi Karen, Hani Masood, Sharina Nadura, Tate Maria Studio, and Maria Tarasena. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us. Yes.